The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. What's going on, everyone? Welcome to the broadcast tonight. It is Tuesday, November 15th. We welcome all of our Spotify and Apple listeners that are listening uh, by Spotify and you guys that are watching live here on Facebook and you guys that will be watching a rebroadcast of this tonight. I want to deal with the epitome of compromise. Uh, and the reason why I want to deal with this, I believe this, if I had to handpick and cherry pick one particular thing that is dominant right now, that is leading people into bondage, leading people to fall away from the church, leading people to uh, depart from the faith. I believe it starts with this right here and it's compromise. So t- that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. The epitome of compromise. We're going to go right into the book of Judges. I believe <clears throat> the story of Samson is one of the greatest illustrations of this. Um, right here in Judges chapter 13. We're going to start here in Judges chapter 13. We're going to give you a little bit of a backdrop on Samson and his life, and then we're just going to plow from there and see where the Holy Spirit would have us go. Here we go. Judges chapter 13. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, of Danites, excuse me, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said unto her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and do not eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Now, this is very interesting because before Samson was ever birthed, God first visited the parents that would conceive the child. And God began to give begin to give uh, begin to give specific instructions to Manoah and his wife. Now, why is that significant? Because, listen, what we do as parents absolutely reflect and will impact our children, whether good, whether bad, uh, bondages, addictions, habits, lifestyles, compromise, all these things will either positively impact or negatively impact your children and your seed, depending on what type of lifestyle and consecration that you're living either to the Lord or not to the Lord. So God had to deal with his mother first and tell her, I do not want you or I'd rather I would I want you to abstain from strong drink and not eat anything unclean. <clears throat> Why? Because God had a call upon this child. Look at this. For behold, you, con- you, sh- you will conceive and bear a son. And the Lord said he will be a Nazarite to God from the womb. Now we'll talk more about that in just a second. Let me read on. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of that of an angel. Very awesome, but I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. But we know, again, according to Scripture, it was an angel of God. It appeared. Now, the Lord spoke through this angel to Samson's mother and said, that he will be a Nazarite. Now, what is a Nazarite? The Nazarite vow is taken by individuals who have voluntarily dedicated themselves unto God. It's a form of consecration or sanctification. The vow was a decision or action and a desire on the part of the people whose desire is to yield themselves to God completely. By definition, the Hebrew word 
Nazir simply means to be separated or consecrated. Again, in the New Testament understanding of this, it would be sanctified or sanctification or to be set apart. There were three guidelines given to the Nazarite. In Numbers 6, 3 through 7, it tells us that he or she was to abstain from wine or any fermented drink, nor was the Nazarite to drink grape juice or even eat grapes, raisins, not even the seeds or skins of that. Next, the Nazarite was to never cut their hair for the length of the vow of consecration. Lastly, they were not to go near a dead body because that would make them ceremonially unclean. Even if a member of his immediate family died, he was not to even go near the corpse. Oh, this is when we get into the meat of this message, it's all going to make sense. So let's recap real quick. They made a vow to not drink any intoxicating drink and not to even come near a vineyard. A, so in today's vernacular or today's understanding, this would be like they would not go near a bar, a club, a party or a location where they would be tempted to partake of alcohol or intoxicating drink. They were not permitted to cut uh, a, a, um, a Nazarite was not permitted to cut their hair nor beard. And it, this likely derived from Leviticus 19.27. They said, you shall not shave around the sides of your beard, nor shall you disfigure the edges of your beard. Obviously, this does not apply to us today under the new covenant. But this, again, we got to understand this was an act of consecration. And it was an outward expression of an inward devotion and dedication to the covenant and relationship they had with God. Today, this would be similar to what many Pentecostal holiness and apostolics do with outward expressions to set themselves apart from the world through the way they dress. No facial hair, no makeup, uh, dresses, no pants, etc., etc. Again, nothing wrong with that. I'm not, I'm not here to bash that. And I've said this before, you know, a lot of people, they, they've coined that as legalism, but I, if I had to err on the side of legalism versus a, the liberty to do whatever I wanted to do, I would how much rather lean towards legalism because listen, I'm going to tell you right now, I'd rather be in a church. Come on, let me just preach right here for just a moment. I'd rather be in a church with a, with some Pentecostal. Come on, spirit-filled, devil-stomping women of God that don't have any makeup, don't wear pants, has a long skirt on, and is not showing any of their skin. But come on, they may not be the quote-unquote most attractive to look at by worldly standards. Are you listening to me? I didn't say that. I'm just saying by worldly standards because they don't look like or, or sound like or are part of the part of the world. But come on, I'd rather be in a church filled with these women of God that know how to pray, know how to touch God, know how to come on, be at the, uh, to hang on to the horns of the altar and get the attention of God. Call, come on, cast out devils and raise the dead and heal the sick any day of the week. Then go to some modern condition contemporary church where uh, they look more like the world. They got everything hanging out for everybody to see. There's no shame in exposing their body and they can't even fight themselves out of a wet paper sack because they're not interested in spiritual warfare and they've never been taught these things. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? Now, if you can find, if we can find the middle ground, Again, I there's to me, I'm not offended by makeup. My wife wears makeup. I'm not offended by pants. My wife wears blue jeans. I'm not offended by jewelry. My wife wears jewelry. And that doesn't mean she's not a woman of God. And and that doesn't mean you're not either if you don't partake of those things. What I'm trying to say to you today is this. When we set ourselves apart from God. There is a place of consecration in which God speak to, speaks to us and we abstain from things not out of legalities or uh, out of legal obligations, 
but because our heart's desire is to please God. And we know that there's things that God tells us in his word that grieves him, that angers him, that is detestable to him. So why in the world would I want to partake of those things? Instead, I want to be consecrated from those things. I I, got to move on or I'm not going to get through this message. They were commanded to abstain from dead things. Oh, Boy, am I going to preach on this in just a moment. We can see in the New Testament, John the Baptist also came almost exactly the same thing. We know that John's parents had a supernatural encounter. His father had an encounter with God when he was doing his priestly duties. The, uh, Gabriel spoke to him and said that he would bear a son and he would be mighty in the earth. He would be a voice crying in the wilderness. And John was a Nazarite. He partook of no strong drink. He never, he, uh, he, um, a razor never come to his face. And he did not touch any unclean thing. Now, that's in Luke 1, 13 through 17, by the way, if you want to look that up in your own time. Now, I want to go down here. To the ver- We're still in Judges 13. Now, we get, let me get to verse. Let's go on down here to verse 7. And he said unto me, Behold, this is still his mother speaking. You shall conceive and bear a son. She's speaking to her husband. Now drink no wine or similar drink or eat anything clean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come to us again and teach us what we shall do, for the child will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And then the woman ran into haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared unto me. So Manoah rose and followed his wife. And when he came to see the man, he said unto him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He's obviously speaking to about his wife. And he said, I am. And Manoah said, now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and his work? So a third time, the angel speaks and says to Manoah, all, all of that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine. She may not drink anything that's a strong drink or touch anything unclean. And all that I command her, let her observe it. So we know that they obeyed the word of the Lord. Samson was born. He was dedicated unto the Lord before he was ever born to his parents. He was, he was already set apart. Come on. I remember when uh, the Lord spoke to me about my firstborn, Elijah. And before he was ever born, we knew that he would be a boy. Some of y'all heard me talk about this. I had uh, a, a word from God about this. I had dreams about him. And we dedicated him before he, was e- before he ever came out of the womb. We prayed over him in the womb. We dedicated him unto God. And we gave him to the Lord to use him for his mighty work. But, we, but my wife and I, we knew we had to do our part. Come on, somebody. Let me talk to all the parents that are listening today. Train up the child in which and the way in which they should go, that they should not depart from it as as they and as they get older, they shall not depart from it. So Samson is born. He's consecrated. He's set apart. He begins to grow in both in stature and spirit of the Lord upon his life. But watch what happens as he gets older and he begins to mature. Puberty kicks in. Come on. Verse 14, Judges chapter 14. Now we're going down here to the next chapter. Now, Samson, listen to this. Samson went down to Timnah Timnah, and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Uh Uh-oh. He wasn't supposed to be checking out women from the Philistines. He's not supposed to be checking out Philistine, Philistinian women. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, quote, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, go get her for me as my wife. 
Verse three. And then his father and mother said, is there no, I'm going to paraphrase this. Is there not any other women out there among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you may go and get a wife from them? But instead, you pick these uncircumcised Philistines. Come on. Today's vernacular, that would be, can you not, can you not look for a nice girl that is spirit filled, full of the Holy Ghost and loves God right here in our church? Why are you checking out girls that hang around these places or these people that are not sanctified? They don't go to church. They don't read their Bible. Come on, somebody. Are you listening to me? And Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she pleases me. In other words, I don't really care what your desire is or what the consequences is because she is pleasing to me, to my sight. Oh, I know where I'm going with this today. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. Now watch this, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. Sure, Samson. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Watch, oh, look at this. Samson began looking for a spouse in the wrong places with good intentions. Let me say that again. Samson began, to be, Samson began looking for something good in wrong places or a spouse in wrong places. Listen, how many believers have made this mistake? You know before you get after Samson, let me just talk to somebody right here. I've heard this over and over again. Well, pastor or brother, whatever. I, I've heard women say this. I've heard men say this. Well, they're a good person. Well, they've got a good heart. Well, they said they're going to go to church. Do they go to church now? No, but they've already told me that once we get married, they're going to start going to church. Do they read the Bible? No, they don't really read the Bible, but they've already told me that once we get married, they're going to start reading the Bible. Do they have a prayer life? No, not really. Um, but they said that once we get married, they promised that they will start going to church. Watch this. And because many Christians ignore discernment because they're captivated by lust, they're captivated by visual men and women. They're being drawn by the lust of their eyes and the lust of the flesh, and they're ignoring, they're ignoring all the red flags. And because of this, they're getting themselves in trouble. They claim they found the perfect man, the perfect woman, but yet the individual is not saved. They they don't even they don't have uh, any dedication to the to the Lord. They, this is what Second Corinthians six fourteen Paul talked about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. And he said, "What fellowship does righteousness have with lawlessness? And what communion?" does light have with darkness but yet we see it all the time then so we go on judges 14 5 and 6 i'm we're still building a foundation and then we're going to just bring this home and get to this and i'm going to show you something so samson this is in judges 14 5 uh we're going to start at verse 5 here so samson went down to timna Timnah, how do you pronounce that? With his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now, here we go again. Now, they're in a vineyard where they have no business around. Because remember, in a Nazarite vow, you were not to even be in the proximity of a vineyard. But this is what compromise does. You begin to lower your standards. You begin to tippy toe the line. You begin to do things that you said you wouldn't do in times past or you didn't do in times past. And then you give a little bit of a, an edge here. You give a little bit there. And all of a sudden, it's, it's like a domino effect. Now, to his surprise, but watch this, even in our state of compromise, God will send people, 
circumstances or things in our path to get our attention, to get us back on course. This is exactly what happened with Samson. So he's looking for a woman among the uncircumcised Philistines. He's now in a vineyard and he's dragged his, come on, his family in it. You ever notice when, come on, when you have a child, a grandson, a husband, a wife, whatever, you have a family member that gets into sin and compromise. Not only does it affect them, but it starts impacting the whole family unit. Oh, who am I preaching to today? Listen, husband, listen, wife. Your little decision, you think it's only hurting you, but it's impacting everybody. And I'm going to prove that in just a moment. But look at this. God sent a young lion lion, into Samson's path that roared against him. Now, I know some, listen, some spiritual Christian would come along that has no discernment and be like, well, that's the roaring lion. That's the, that's the devil. That's Satan. Because after all, 1 Peter says that Satan is like a roaring lion going to and fro and seeking who he may devour. Yes, but the Bible also indicates that, that Jesus can also be the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's why you have to discern this. Again, let's look at the context. If Samson was doing what was right and serving the Lord then I could say, yes, this was an attack against him from the enemy. But in this case, he was in a vineyard where he was not supposed to be in because he had a vow and a covenant and he was set apart for God. So this lion came. Why did it come, Brother Ricky? It was sent by God to stop him. It was a wake-up call. But Samson had already made up his mind. I'm going to get this girl and I'm going to find me a woman from the Philistines because that's what I'm attracted to. I know they're not uncircumcised. I know they're uncircumcised. I know they're not sanctified. I know they're not serving God. I know they don't have a relationship with God, but man, do I like them brunettes or those blondes or those dark skinned girls or the light skinned girls or the tall girls or come on that body shape or this body shape. Who am I talking to today? Or come on, let me talk to the ladies for a minute. I know that I shouldn't be talking to that man and I know that I should be walking away, but he's just tall, dark and handsome and he's got a lot of money and he's got he's got influence and he's a smooth talker and he just and he's romantic and he's uh influential and he's popular and he's come on so so what god does he sends men and women of god through preaching teaching podcasts, YouTube videos, whatever, and they, they deliver you a warning to you, but you, you have, you're so bent on fulfilling the lust of your flesh that you're ignoring the warning signs. Man, I'm telling you, I know I'm hitting somebody today. So the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him and he tore the line apart as one would, who had been torn apart, a, a, who, had, who had torn apart a young goat, that he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Why? Why didn't he tell? Samson, why didn't you tell your mom and daddy what you did? Gee, I wonder why. Because he already knew he was not supposed to be in the vineyard to begin with. Now you may say, well, Brother Ricky, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he tore the lion. Why would the Spirit of the Lord come upon him to be able to destroy this lion if God sent the lion in the first place? Because the gifts and callings are without repentance. It's the same reason why when someone is backslid or they departed from the faith, unless they go into a reprobate state, the gifts and callings are still on them. Oh, come on. How deep you want to go with this? That's why they can still preach. There's still an anointing. There's still gifts operating through them. That's where we get over into the book of Matthew. And you have this group of individuals that say, Lord, did we not cast out devils in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? Did we not do many miracles in your name? Again, those are not sinners. Those were individuals who had a relationship with God and were used mightily by God, but something happened along the way. 
Wow. How many of us keep pursuing the wrong paths, knowing the Lord is not pleased with our decisions? And many times, if we're actually paying attention, again, he will send a wake-up call on our path. Hello, Balaam? Remember, Balaam was using the gift that God gave him, and he was using it for divination. And God spoke through a donkey that he was riding on to try to stop him. Peter denied the Lord three times and a rooster got his attention. Are you listening to me today? What's it going to take to get your attention? Jonah was running from God, rebelling against God, and living for himself. Yeah, I know God called me to go and preach to Nineveh, but I'm going to do what I want to do. And he ran from God in the opposing direction, got onto a ship, sailed in a different direction, and because, listen, his disobedience ended up impacting and affecting everybody else around him. The sailors were shook up. The boat was shook up. The, sh the storm came and it didn't single Jonah out. Everybody was being impacted by the storm because of one man's disobedience. Come on. One individual in your whole household can be in rebellion against God and it brings the storm upon the whole family unit. One individual can go out, take one drink, become an alcoholic, get drunk one time, get into a car accident and kill somebody in a drink, drunk driving accident. They kill them. Now your son or your daughter has now committed an act of murder or manslaughter. And now it's come upon your whole family. Now, Judges 14, 7 and 8. Then he went down and talked with the woman. You still ain't learned, have you, Samson? You still going to keep going? We're, now we're lying to our parents. We're keeping things from our parents. We're pulling them into it. We're ignoring warning signs. We're looking in the wrong places. Now look at this. He went down and talked with the woman. He had one woman that he had. Oh, this was the woman. She pleased Samson well. I bet she did. After some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Now remember, Samson was a Nazarite. He was to abstain from any dead thing. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. So verse 9 he took some of it in his hands and went along eating. So this dude, are you seeing this? The progression of compromise. Now he's, he's breaching every one of these covenants that he made with God, these vows that he made with God, the standards that he had. He's, this one's lowering, this one's lowering, that one's lowering. And now he's got his hands right into a carcass of a dead animal. And he's pulling honey out of it, eating it. Watch this. And when he came to his father and mother, he gave, he gave some to them and they also ate, but he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. Now he is, oh, come on. Now he's partaking of this sin and compromise and he's spreading it among his family. This, listen, we cannot be foolish enough to believe that we can obtain anything sweet from what God has called dead. You cannot expect God's blessings to flow in your life while you're still playing around and messing around with dead things. You can't continue to be yoked with old friends, old lifestyles, and old habits when you've said yes to him because those things are dead to you. 
If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. For the old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. But see, this, but compromise is what I'm talking about today. This is prevalent in the body of Christ. This is why there's no conviction. This is why there's, there's no victories. There's, the devils are not manifested because they're, they're comfortable in our very midst because nobody has any power. Nobody has any anointing. And I'm going to show you this. We're going to get, we're going to go any even farther in this. Samson is so focused on his own lust that he's continued continually to compromise his lifestyles that he's not even aware that he's now impacting his entire family and not just himself. himself. When we discover that after this, Samson's life began to... Now watch what happened. The slow fade continued in Samson's life. The dominoes kept falling and eventually... Samson ends up, and as a result of this, watch this, constant turmoil, confrontations, and ended up even losing his own wife, whom he had to have. I've got to have her. I don't care what I'm going to compromise. I don't care what I'm going to lose. I don't care if I lose it all. I've got to have this woman, this man, this thing. The Bible says that he later became captured. He ended up having sex with a harlot and got tangled up with Delilah in Judges chapter 16, which would ultimately be the nail in the coffin for Samson. Now, I want to show you this. What, now, how did this come about? Now, all right, so now we're, we're, we're bringing this plane on into the landing. We're going to, we're, we're bringing this thing home right here. What happened was a spirit of lust came after Samson. It had his number. It marked him. It was chasing him down. Satan knew Samson's weakness. It wasn't his hair. Everybody's, well, Samson's weakness was his strength and it was in his hair. And when you cut his hair, he'd lose his strength. We've heard this all through uh, all the years that we've been Christian. We heard this in Sunday school and uh, there's stories that we read children to this. No, his weakness was lust. He fell to seduction, a seducing spirit. The word seduce means to persuade to disobedience or disloyalty. See, this all, oh, come on, somebody. The spirit of lust was on Samson's life and it slowly caused him to begin to compromise here a little, there a little. And it against, again, it wasn't an instantaneous overnight thing, but as time progressed, he got deeper and deeper into the bondage of lust. Let me give you another definition per, to persuade, to disobedience or disloyalty. Here's number two, to lead astray, usually by persuasion or false promises. And number three, to lure away slowly from truth to error. Are you listening to me? Let, I'm going to read that this is from uh, Proverbs chapter 5, verses 1 through 23. This is written by David's son, Solomon, who wrote this. Listen what he said about the spirit of lust. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death and her steps lay hold of hell. 
Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable, you do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the cruel one. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth and your labors go to the house of a foreigner and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and say, listen to this quote, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Drink water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed to broad streams of water in the streets, let them be your own and not strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your, of your youth as a loving deer and graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman? Now, I know we're talking about a, uh, the verbiage here is an actual woman here, but it's a spirit. It's a spirit of lust. And it, why should you be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his past. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man. And he is caught in the cords of his own sin. He shall die for lack of instruction and the greatness of his folly shall he go astray. Let me read you another. This is Proverbs 7 verses 5 through 27. He talks about heeding wisdom and listening to counsel and obeying the commandments that are given to you as your youth. He said, watch this, that they would keep you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words. Notice it starts with words. I'm going to show you in a minute when we get deeper with Delilah here uh, and Samson, how she persuaded him with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and I saw among the simple, I, per, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding. I'm telling you, lust will come after you when you're young, when you're a young man, when you're a young woman. They start when you're a teenager. Lust comes after you when you're even in elementary school. Come on, we've got the spirit of perversion. In schools, working overtime, being uh, coming into the educational system in the name of education. Look what's being taught to our kids. Look what's being performed in the name of affirming an alternate lifestyle. It's a spirit. It's a deceiving, lustful spirit. And it's going right after the children at an early age. The writer said that this young man is devoid of understanding. We got to listen. We've got to get the word of God in, in the, in the hearts of these young men and young women at an early age, because Satan wants to get them right away and fill them with all kinds of nonsense, fill them with entertainment of the world, fill them with pornography, fill them with hatred and bitterness and unbelief and hatred towards God and witchcraft and darkness. The writer says, I saw the young man passing along the street near her corner. We have got to have discernment. And we don't have any business being on the corner of where lust is. Now you say, what are you talking about? Listen, if you are a recovering alcoholic, the last place you're going to be seen is near a bar, near a club, near a liquor store. If you're dealing with lust, why in the world would you go to a beach in the middle of July where everybody's wearing, come on, thongs and, and two-piece bikinis everywhere? Come on, who am I talking to today? Are we? Come on, is this too real for you? He said, I saw the young man passing the street near her corner and he took the path 
to her house. In the twilight, in the evening. Come on, isn't that what lust does? It likes to operate in the stealth of darkness. It likes to, come on, lust likes to come after you when you're alone, when it's dark, when, when the spouse is asleep, when the children are away, when you're all by yourself, you're, on, you're uh, on a business trip, you're in a hotel by yourself. Come on, lust is knocking at the door. In the twilight, in the evening, in the dark of the night, and there a woman met him. I'm telling you, if you if you get if you start going on on the, on the path of lust, lust is already waiting for you. You don't have to knock at the door. I'm telling you, before you knock on that door, lust has already got the door open with the welcome mat saying, "Come on in." I've been waiting. Listen, watch this. And there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. And at times she was outside at times in the open square lurking at every corner. Lust is lurking at every corner, looking for its victims. You say, well, I thought this was a message about compromise. It is. We're still on compromise. Why? I'm a, we're going to tie it all home here. Verse 13, so she caught him and kissed him with an impudent face. She said to him, I had peace offerings with me today. I paid my vow, so I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face. And I have found you. And it, listen, it goes on. I want to read all this for a second time. Let me read on down here. Verse 21, with enticing speech, she caused him to yield compromise. I got your attention with her flattering lips. She seduced him immediately. He went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Are you listening to that verbiage or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare. He didn't, he did not know it would cost his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children, pay attention to the words of my mouth. Verse 25. This is Proverbs 7, 25. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways do not stray into her paths for she has cast down many wounded and all who were slain by her were strong men oh there is guys i could do a whole message on this listen people that are in bondage to sexual immorality adultery fornication uh, homosexuality, uh, and the list goes on. You will discover that many of these people that uh, suffer with these bondages, they struggle with these bondages, pornography, the list goes on. Any, All these are defined as sexual immorality. There is always wounds involved. There is always hurts involved. There's always rejection involved. There's always abandonment involved. All these things are wounds. And look at this. She has cast down many wounded. Lust is looking for weakness. And all who were slain were strong men. And I'll say strong women. Her house, look at this is terrifying. Verse 27, her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Once you entertain lust and parade of its fruit, it will continue to lure you deeper and deeper into compromise where you will ultimately be in bondage and captivity. Oh, now let me close this message. Judges chapter 16. It says that Samson is now at the end of this cycle of compromise, this progression of compromise. Now he's to a point where he's got his head laid in the lap of lust. It's in the lap of Delilah. 
Selah. And the Bible says in verse, this is Judges 16, 15. She said unto him, here we go, the words of her mouth. How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me what is your strength? Where does your strength lie? And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him. That's where we get the word oppression. So that his soul was vexed to death. Oh, that word vexed there. It's used in the same connotation as it's in, in, the, uh, in the story of Lot. When we go into G uh, uh, Genesis chapter 19, it says of Lot, it says that Lot was a righteous man who was vexed by the filthiness of the conversation of the wicked daily. He was oppressed. The, it, it began to weigh him down. He couldn't think straight. He couldn't consecrate, uh, concentrate correctly. He couldn't get, he couldn't get, he couldn't get into some good prayer. He, he had, he was like, he was in a fog and, and it was the oppression. It was the weightiness. And look at this. Delilah was opening her mouth and weighing him down, vexing him, pressing him. Why? Because listen, Samson had what he thought was a good intention to find a woman of the Philistines so that he could get a one up for God when the end it come on the enemy ended up finding a weakness in him and here he is being vexed eventually over a period of time Samson became so weakened by the spirit of lust through compromise that he opened his heart and told her everything about his vow unto God and ended up breaking all the vows that he made to the Lord. And as a result of this, he quenched, vexed, and grieved the Spirit of God after uh, off of his life. And the, eventually the Philistines came upon him and he decided he thought he could just shake himself one more time. He thought that the anointing of God would come upon him, that God would use him mightily and get the victory. But he noticed he, could, he was shaking and hucking and bucking and doing everything he did in times past and the anointing came in upon him and God wasn't there. God wasn't in it. The spirit wasn't there. Why? Because he had allowed the spirit of lust to be, to vex him, quench him and grieve him to the point where he compromised and compromised and compromised till he lost the anointing. He lost the victory. He ended up going into captivity to the Philistines. They plucked out his eyes. They put him in chains. They put Put him into a place where he was going round and round and round. And this is the end game for those who are succumbed to come on the spirit of lust and compromise in these time in the times of the end. This is what I came by to tell you today. I want to tell you that if, if I had to pinpoint anything that this generation is dealing with young and old that is on an all time level it is a spirit of compromise and a spirit of lust that is absolutely attached to it because the lust is what causes the compromise I'm going to listen. We're going to pray for some folks. We're going to pray for all of us because I believe we all deal with this in some form or fashion Charles Spurgeon once said, I believe that one reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. G. Campbell Morgan said, quote, the reason why men do not look to the church today is, is because she has destroyed her own influence by compromise. A.W. Tozer said, quote, any spirit that permits compromise with the world is a false spirit. Any religious movement that imitates the world in any of its manifestations is false to the cross of Christ and on the side of the devil. That's A.W. Tozer. Now, listen, here's the altar call. Here's the I don't want to leave Samson 
blind, bound, going round and round. I want to give you the good news. Because see, oh, here's the Bible says in Judges 16 that Samson had come to his senses. Samson had come to the point where he had realized that he messed it up. He realized that he had compromised to the point where he grieved the Spirit of God off of his life. And what did he do? He began to repent. He turned to God. He wept. He turned to the Lord. He began to repent and he rededicated himself back to God. And the Bible says in Judges 16, his hair began to grow again. And that represented the covenant. Come on. The covenant was back again. The vow was being reestablished again. The Bible says in Judges 16, 28 through 30, that he called on God and said, remember me, I pray and strengthen me. And I pray just this once, O God, that it may be with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And God anointed him one more time to get the victory in Jesus' name. Come on. And that was in the old covenant. And it was under, come on. And that was under the law. How much more of a better promise do we have under the new covenant, under the blood of Jesus? What am I saying today? I'm saying today, uh, whoever I'm talking to today, you recognize that you have allowed the spirit of lust to comp- to to allow compromise to come into your home, come into your ministry, come into your life, come into your marriage, come into your family unit, whatever that looks like. You begin. You've lowered the standards. Your morality has lowered your vows have been breached your covenant has been breached you're no longer living the standards you used to live you're now looking lukewarm you're looking compromised you have conformed to this world but my friends just like Samson if you recognize today this very thing by the spirit of God today God is calling you to repent he's calling you to repent where you're at come on you can just turn to him right now let the tears flow again let your heart be opened again let your heart break before him the bible says a broken heart and a contrite spirit he will not turn away father come on let's just do this right now father in the name of jesus i include every one of us in this prayer father we repent of any compromise in our life any small thing any large thing lord we we repent of any compromise lord stand Standards that we once had that we lowered, vows that we once made, and things that we consecrated unto you that we've over time have lowered them things, and we've allowed ourselves to compromise here and compromise a little there and a little there. And maybe by the Spirit of the Lord today and by the Word of God today, we realize that we are smack dab our head in the middle of Delilah's lap, allowing her to persuade us to do things that we would have never done 10 years ago, 15 years ago, five years ago, or whatever that looks like to you. Today is the day that you rise up, get out of the lap of Delilah, shake off the dead things. Come on, get away from the intoxication of the world, the things that are altering your senses, shake off this stuff, run from this stuff, abstain from this stuff and put off this stuff and run towards God and make a vow to him. Consecrate yourself unto him. Why do I need to do this, brother Ricky? Because God has called us to finish this race and finish this strong. Listen, and it, it, it and it's not just about us. Mama, it's not about just us, Daddy. It's not about just us, grandparents. It's about our children, our grandchildren. It's about our husband. It's about our wife. It's about our whole household. Listen, here's the, here's the, the, the awesome news about this. If, if one individual's lifestyle can impact the whole family unit, in turmoil and storms and tribulation, what could one individual do 
And what could be the outcome if one individual rose up like Joshua and said, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. And friends, when you make that declaration and you begin to walk in that, then you'll begin to see God's blessing upon your life. Then you'll see God's breakthroughs coming to you and your family. Then you begin to see his favor reside in your family. Come on, do you receive this today? Come on just repent where you're at get right with God get back on course and finish the race that's set before us in Jesus name father I thank you for this word that's went forth I pray that it would not return void I thank you for the repentance that's coming from this come on the rededications that's coming to this I thank you for the prodigals that are coming back to the Lord the people that are getting right with God I thank you the anointing is coming back the gifts are being activated once again Lord I thank you that they are walking afresh and what you began in them you are faithful to finish it and see that it's complete into the day of redemption and we give you praise and glory in jesus mighty name and all god's people said amen and amen listen friends god bless you and thank you so much for being a part of this broadcast listen two things i need you to do one is i want you to download our free app available on apple and android Hit yes to push notifications. Be notified of every headline and every podcast when it's readily available. And then I want you to pray about becoming a monthly partner. It allows us to remain strong and uh, continue the work of the ministry year after year. You could do that, becoming a monthly partner. Pray about it and ask the Lord what He would have what He would have you do. You can do that two different ways. You can give electronically through the app, or you can give by check or money order, and you can make that out to End Time Headlines. And that's P.O. Box 1391, Monroe, Georgia, 30655. We're going to sign off for today. We will uh, we will not be here tomorrow on Wednesday, but we will be back on Thursday. And we've got some great messages coming up on Thursday and Friday. So be sure to tune in uh, on Thursday and Friday. God bless you. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.